Well, good morning, California Community Church. Uh, it is good to kind of see you <laughs> this morning. Uh, so glad that we get to be here uh, together in a way as a body of believers to worship Jesus. Um, so I'm going to open our time in prayer, and we're going to start worshiping him through song. So, Lord, we thank you for this time to, uh, to sing your praise. Lord, you are good. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And during this time, we ask that you would help us fix our eyes on you, our Savior, our friend, um, our good Lord, Jesus. Um, to you be the glory this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Is so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless and not in wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun and part of His brilliance. The King of Glory, the King of the Fall Kings. Yes, He's amazing. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy Worthy, worthy, Lord, that says amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest free, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, a cornerstone, weak and made strong in the Savior's love. Through the song, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, the cornerstone, weak and strong, and the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is love. I stand before the throne when he shall come when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then can have me found dressed in his righteousness alone for less I stand before the throne Thank you so much for being a part of this today, and uh, during our worship time, if you're singing along at home or wherever you're watching, uh, that's terrific. And if not, just I hope you've enjoyed the band and those lyrics just penetrated your heart, and I, I hope they brought you comfort and a sense of the nearness of Jesus to you. A couple of things I want you to be aware of. Next weekend is Easter, and we are so excited. Easter online. I mean, this is historic. Churches all over the world will be doing it online next week, and uh, that's different. What's exciting about it is that no matter what happens in history, the message of Jesus prevails. And we're going to share that prevailing message next week, and we have four different service times for you to watch and experience this yourself. So 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, these are all Pacific time, 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m., and then 6 p.m. So three in the morning, one at night, Easter Sunday, uh, we're going to be right here for you. There's going to be activities for your kids, activities for high schoolers, so you're going to want to check out our website, calchurch.com, for all the family resources, all the age groups, there's going to be something for you. Now, here's a request. 
we're going to be experiencing communion together uh, digitally, technologically. And so what I need you to prepare for is have a little bit of juice and a little bit of bread or something equivalent to that next Sunday ready so that when we get to the part of communion in the service, you'll be able to experience that and share communion uh, with us. Now, you know, I've been trying to find a little bit of laughter every day. Somebody referred to this season of time, uh, of course, as the biggest church pajama party in history because you might be wearing your pajamas right now. Somebody else says this is the longest running introvert holiday in history. And if you're an introvert, you certainly can relate to that. But in the middle of the laughter, we also know that there are tears because this has been a frightening time. This has been a very stressful time for so many people. Anxiety is up. Depression numbers are up. Doctors are talking about it. Psychologists, psychiatrists are talking about it. We've all felt a little of that anxiety for our own reasons through this season. And because of that, we know that we should be as close to the Lord as we can be to experience all of His help and comfort So what I want to do right now is pray for each one of us. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know that people are frazzled and afraid. They are tired and they are troubled. We don't know how long this is going to last, and that's unnerving. But Father, I look back on my life and what I realize at other times when I did not know what tomorrow would hold, I was able to trust the one who holds tomorrow. So strong Jesus, I am asking you to breathe your peace right now into the spirit of every person who's listening today, that they would just feel your presence even now. And Lord, I'm asking you to breathe your strength into our days so that when we wake up each morning, You're there meeting us ready with all that we'll need to face another day. By ourselves, Lord, we would just be so rocked and unable to actually carry on. But with your presence, with your power, with your peace, we can face this and emerge on the other side. We trust you for this. We're asking for this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to California Community Church Online. It's exciting to me that every week we have new friends, and I am thankful that you're part of the community today. And I just want you to know our commitment is to bring you meaningful, helpful, encouraging, challenging teaching every single week and uplifting worship week after week after week. Now, you can experience this a lot of ways. You can find us on our website. That's where some of you are right now, calchurch.com. Some of you are uh, participating from the Cal Church app, Cal Church app. You can get that at the App Store. Or you can go to our Facebook page, California Community Church Facebook page, and you can do Facebook Live with us. And with that, you can even invite your friends to be a part of it. Now, if you're new uh, with us today, I want you to know this is week five in a series that I've been teaching to help us expose Jesus. What I want us to do is really discover together who he really is, to get behind the rhetoric to just pierce the religious assumptions and do a deep dive into the historical documents that were written by eyewitnesses of his life. For the most part, we have looked at a biography of Jesus' life written by a medical doctor, a a man of science. And you have to know, he would have been meticulous in his details. And he lived with Jesus. And he walked with Jesus. And he listened to his words. And he observed his activities and his actions. And he wrote all of this down. His name is Luke. And Dr. Luke became so certain in the identity of Jesus as God, so certain that Jesus had the power to forgive sins, that he took all of these detailed notes so that others like us who read his writings all this time later, we'd be able to have that same certainty about who Jesus really is. And I will tell you, the Jesus that he revealed is very different than the popular notions that exist about Jesus in our culture today. 
So if you missed the first four weeks, they're available in our video archives on our website, calchurch.com. They're available by podcast, and I'd encourage you to spend some time catching up and listening to those, those first four weeks. And hundreds of people have been accessing those uh, because they want to be a part of this teaching series. Now, here we are week five, and here's what we're going to learn about Jesus today. And if you have your note page, you'll see it. If you're on our website, you can actually download the note page. You can print it off, and you can take notes with us. But here's the point for the morning. Jesus flips the script on what it means to live. He flips the script. Like, people thought, this is what life is, and Jesus said, no, I'm going to teach you what life is, and it was something entirely different than what people expected. Let me give you some context. When we catch up with Jesus today in the writings of Dr. Luke, Jesus has been teaching and performing miracles and ministering to people now for three full years. And I got to tell you, it's been a tough three years. He was so unlike the expectation that people had for the Messiah, the promised one of Israel, Even though prophets had said, this is exactly what Messiah will be like, when Jesus came on the scene as Messiah, it blew people's minds. He shocked his culture. For those three years of his ministry, his days were marked with tension and drama. During all of those three years, other people tried to trap Jesus into saying things that would be considered against the law or blasphemous religiously. There were many attempts to try to trap him and kill him. I mean, you read the three years of his ministry, it was the stuff of espionage and intrigue. But that was the real life of Jesus. And everybody knew, everybody knew that the killing of Jesus would eventually happen in Jerusalem. And after three years of ministry, in and out of Jerusalem during those years, the heat was now high and murder was in the air. And Jesus said to his disciples, we are going back to Jerusalem. Tension sizzled like electricity. And this started the final week before Jesus was executed. Here's what happened in that week. On the Saturday and Sunday before, Jesus starts in Bethany, close to Jerusalem. It's six days before the Jewish holiday of Passover. Crowds are filling the streets, moving and traveling toward Jerusalem. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus visits Jerusalem. On Monday, Passover lambs were selected. Now you have to imagine what this was like as Jesus watched these lambs carefully culled from their flocks. These are the lambs that would be sacrificed on Passover for the sins of others. And as Jesus watched that, he knew that he soon would be a sacrificial lamb to take away our sins. On Tuesday, some religious leaders began to plot ways to kill him. In that evening, Jesus left Jerusalem and presumably returned to Bethany. On Wednesday, Jesus predicted that in two days he would be crucified during the time of Passover. And Judas began his plan to betray Jesus to the religious establishment. And Jesus, he knew this was coming. On Thursday, Jesus and his disciples prepared for their own Passover. And they had their Seder meal together. And Jesus shared heartfelt words with his disciples and he offered an intercessory prayer on their behalf and then after they arrived in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus suffered in agony anticipating what was going to come and then later that night Jesus was betrayed and he was arrested and all night he faced condemnation and mock trials into the next morning where he stood before the Sanhedrin and then Pilate and then Herod Antipas and back to Pilate again and then convicted. He was led to the cross and crucified at about 9 a.m. and he hung on that cross suffering for us until he died at 3 p.m. and he was buried later that day. Jesus died at the same time Passover lambs were being sacrificed. Their bleeding cries were heard throughout the city and the sky turned dark black. That was Friday and Jesus died. What I want to do for our purposes today is rewind that tape just 24 hours. One day, just one day, before Jesus was killed. And don't miss this. He knows he's going to be killed. He knows what's coming. He knows that this is his last 24 hours. What 
Jesus did one day before he died flips the script on how we are truly supposed to live. Let me ask you a question. What would you do if you knew that you were going to die tomorrow? What Jesus did is he gathered his closest followers. He untied his robe, wrapped it around his waist. He got a basin of water and a towel. And he began to wash the feet of his friends, which was the duty of the lowest servant in a Middle Eastern household. With his own death clock ticking, Jesus used his last act of time with his friends to serve them and to demonstrate unselfish love to them. What would you do? Some say, if I had a day to live, I'd max out my credit card. Others of you would say, been there, done that. Some say, I'd eat and drink anything I wanted and wouldn't worry about the calories. One mom was attempting to teach her daughter the importance of living well because life is short. And she said, sweetie, you need to live like this is your last day. And the little girl said, mommy, the last time I did that, you grounded me for two weeks. What if we could get the perspective of Jesus? What if we could orient all of our life around our own mortality? And haven't these been some days where we've had to assess that a little bit more. Haven't we all had to confront the fact in these last days and weeks that life is fragile and life is short? Confronting death should actually inform how we live. And what Jesus did one day before he died reveals the true secrets about how to live our life. So today, I want us to see how Jesus flips the script of what it means to live. If you're taking notes, here's number one. Jesus lived intentionally, not accidentally, so live intentionally. There's your first fill-in. Live intentionally. (coughs) Here's the sad reality. For a long time, living in this wonderful free country with a high quality of life and a steaming red-hot economy, what's happened is we've been seduced into thinking that we had the world by the tail, that the future was bright, and that we were somehow in control. We have given our days and given our time and given our attention and affection to infatuation with success and fitness and wealth and our number of social media followers and to fame and entertainment. We've become intoxicated with all of those and we've settled in to just kind of passing the time. Our Mondays folded into Friday and then we'd recreate on the weekend and then we'd press the repeat button. And days passed and months passed and years passed. And if now celebrities were asked, if athletes were asked, if social media influencers were asked, what's the purpose of each day you live? What is God asking of you each day that you've lived? The answers, I'm afraid, would be empty and disappointing. Because, see, we've just been passing our time without purpose. We've gone through the motions without God. And now, have you noticed? It's very different. The news is no longer talking about celebrities or athletes or the fields of media or entertainment or award ceremonies because the answers to life aren't found there. Because now we know that we're dying. Now we're waking up to the fact that life is short and we should have a purpose and now we're scrambling to find it. And 2,000 years ago, In the last 24 hours of his life, Jesus taught us how to live as terminal people. Spoiler alert, you are terminal, and so am I. You know your birth date, but you don't know your death date. All you know now, all you're keenly aware of now, is that your death date is closer than you once thought it was. And Jesus lived like that. As he went to Jerusalem, he knew his death clock was ticking. He was closer to his death. He was terminal like never before. And knowing that, Jesus didn't just pass his time. He had a very strong purpose and a very clear intention to his days. And he knew. He knew he'd been born for a purpose. He knew that he was born to die for the sins of the world. And he knew that would happen in Jerusalem. And that's why we read, several days before he got to the city, now when the time was almost come, 
for Jesus to be received up to heaven. That's talking about his death. He steadfastly and determinedly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Do you see how this is different than, what do you want to do today? I don't care, or I don't know, or whatever. Jesus lived every day with a clear sense of direction, steadfastness, determination, intentionality. I know that many of you have said at one time in your life that you wanted to live for God. You wanted to be His representative in the world. You wanted to follow Jesus fully with your life. And the question for the terminal person is, are you doing that intentionally every day? Do you take time every day of your life to consider, what am I doing for Jesus today? With my friends and my conversations, how I serve others? Can you get to the end of any day and name one thing that you did on purpose for God today? Here's the spiritual point. If you really believe you're dying, and we all are, it will change the way you're living. Here's what I know. Jesus wants us to live all our remaining days for him. And the ancient Hebrew scriptures teach us, and all the way till now, we're taught that the Lord wants to be first. He wants to be our focus and our purpose. The first of the Ten Commandments, no other gods before him, no other priorities above him. And now, it seems, would be a very good time in history for us to shift that intention of our heart. See, God's giving us a chance in this pandemic to refocus the direction of our heart and the direction of our affections. See, God looked down and He said, you used to worship athletes, and so I will shut down the stadiums. You used to worship musicians, so I'll shut down the arenas. You worship the actors, so I will just shutter the industry. You worship the celebrities, so I'll confine them to their homes. You worshiped money, so I'll shut down the economy and close down the stock market. And listen, God said some of you even worship church. You worshiped it as a task, as a duty. But it wasn't because of affection. It wasn't because Jesus was first. So God said, I'll even close the church buildings. Why? Because there's one intention, one desire, one affection that must be, must be the driving force of your life and mine. Living for Jesus every day on purpose, intentionally. Listen, if you knew that you had 24 hours to live, you'd be very focused on being right with God. And I've said it before. I am terminal, and so are you. If you're watching this with someone else right now, or you're on Facebook Live, maybe part of a watch party, or if you're on your computer, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say it with me. I'm terminal, and so are you. Let's say it together. I'm terminal, and so are you. Matter of fact, if you're part of the live chat feature on our website where uh, one of our elders is moderating and interacting with you in real time, what I want you to do right now is just type that out. I'm terminal. And so are you. Once we understand we're dying, we begin to understand something about living. Now, on that cheery note, let's go to point number two. Number two, Jesus used things and loved people. Jesus used things and he loved people and don't get those reversed. (coughs) Here's the way of the world. This is what almost everybody does. We use people to get ahead. We use our network, our LinkedIn, our relationships to leverage every opportunity for us to make a profit and accumulate more things. Listen, we live for the things and we use the people. And the only thing that will ever change that usually is a crisis. And for sure, it will change if you understand that you're dying. Here's what you're not doing if you know you're dying. You're not checking the stock market. You're not checking out real estate. You're not shopping for the next car, and you're not hitting the mall for more clothes for an already overfilled closet. Here's what you're not doing if you know you're terminal. 
You're not picking up your messages from work on your day off and you're not putting in overtime. No one said on their deathbed, darn, wish I'd spent more time at work. No one says that. You know what doesn't matter when you're dying? More things. You see this all the time. People who their whole life have used others to accumulate more things, then they get a terminal diagnosis, and suddenly you watch them and their whole focus shifts. They pivot. They stop being mean to their employees who they were using to make a profit. They stop obsessing about keeping up or staying ahead of, well, anybody. The life they were living suddenly becomes so futile. You know what terminal people do? They gather their loved ones near. They try to repair broken relationships. They have the conversations that they've been putting off for a long time. They express the love that's been locked away in their heart. One of the beautiful things about this virus is it has stripped us of our desire to chase the wrong things. It's required us to change the pace and the focus of our life. I mean, just look what Jesus did in his last days. He circled his friends closer and closer. He got his faithful followers into this tight-knit, close proximity to him. And Jesus valued people. Listen, he always valued people over things. Always valued people over things. Now, I will tell you, my heart's lifted a little bit in these days because I'm seeing some hopeful signs of this. I'm now seeing dads who were once distracted before the quarantine, now throwing ball with their sons. I'm watching as husbands and wives take long walks together, and they honestly hadn't done that for years. Zoom gatherings between close friends, daily phone calls between those who you love the most. It's happening. And here's my prayer, that we don't get sucked back into business as usual when this is over. Life has never been about things. It's always been about people. Say it with me. Life has never been about things. It's always been about people. Now, I want you to watch this progression of Jesus in his final week. He lived very intentionally, coming to Jerusalem, focused on people, not things. And then this is why this last point shouldn't surprise us. And it tells us something remarkable about the true Jesus. Number three, Jesus gave himself unselfishly to others and we should give ourselves unselfishly to others. The best friend of Jesus was a man named John. And John was an eyewitness of the life of Jesus and he was with Jesus during his last 24 hours. And look at what happened when Jesus was having this Seder meal with his disciples. And John wrote this down. Before the Passover celebration, (coughs) Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He'd loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he loved them to the very end. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again, and he sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. In his last gathering with his friends, Jesus expressed unselfish love. And he said, if my objective in life was to express unselfish love, then yours should be also. I mean, how much longer are we going to make it all about ourselves? How much longer is it going to be all about our lives, our success, our comfort, our profit? What needs to happen in this world before we realize that life isn't about what we do for ourselves, but what we do for others? That's where we find true life. Jesus repeatedly said, flip the script, flip the script. Life is not going to be found in the places you once thought. And he said, I will teach you how to find abundant overflowing true life but he said to find it 
You're going to have to flip the script. I'm going to have to turn everything upside down in your perspective. Jesus said, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Not what you'd think, is it? Jesus said, it's the one who's the least among you who is the greatest. Huh. Jesus said, if you cling to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. You see, it's not about me. Life is really about how I serve others. And it's not about you. It's really about how you serve others. We're hearing remarkable transformations in how people are doing this all over our world right now. I heard the story of a man in Texas who has invented an easier way to build respirators which are so desperately needed right now. And to assemble them, he asked the people in his church to help him do it at his house from his garage. One woman who lived an hour away heard about this and she drove there and she was willing to sleep in this guy's RV out on his driveway every night so that she could work 16-hour days assembling these new respirators and she does it as a volunteer. And listen, the other 60 people who work 16-hour days are also doing it as volunteers because they want to get these respirators out. And this man who invented this new process, he gave his patent away hoping that others will also start manufacturing them. And I would say to you, they have found true life. It's a nurse who after a 14-hour ICU shift went into a room and held the hand of a person with coronavirus because this patient was near the end. And this nurse said, I just wanted to be there and hold their hand so they didn't die alone. And that nurse I would contend, has found the true meaning of life. A 90-year-old woman with COVID-19 in Belgium gave her respirator up so that a younger person could live. And I would say, she found life in the giving of her life. See, the, the hoarders, the selfish, those who scour the land to accumulate for their own safety and comfort, who live in fear for just their own survival, their soul isn't living anyway. But the person who shares, the person who serves, the person who sacrifices, Jesus showed us this is the person who has found abundant life. I want to bottom line this for you today. Check this out, the bottom line. Real and true living is to intentionally live your life for Jesus and love people by giving of yourself in service unselfishly. So let me give you some next steps. Number one, ask every morning, Jesus, what can I do today to further your purposes and plan in this world? Please use me in your work. Number two, ask at the end of each day, have I in any way put things above people today? If so, determine to change that in each new day. And number three, go through each day asking those around you, is there anything I can do to serve you today? Let's pray together. <coughs> Lord Jesus, your example is stunning. When most people would cave and they would be deconstructing in their own spirit because their death was imminent. You actually, Lord, your spirit was surging. You were so filled with purpose and a focus and it was encouraging to those who followed. And then to see you taking your eyes off of your own needs and always placing them on others and then unselfishly and very generously serving your friends with love in your final moments. In your dying, you've taught us, Lord, about living. And that's hopeful and it's helpful and it's encouraging for us who are trying to find our way through these very challenging times. Teach us your way, I pray. And it is in your name I pray. Amen. Now, one final word. 
In this last week, we have gotten many, many reports of people just in our own congregation who have lost jobs and rent has come due and they're in that process like some of you where you're filling out forms for unemployment or is the stimulus check going to arrive in time to do us any good for the needs we have now. And I just want you to know in this week, we've actually distributed thousands of dollars from our own church to help some people in their times of need. Hundreds of that was just for food and then other forms of help. It may be that you have a need and and you could use some assistance and you can let us know that at our church. And for those of you who are giving, you need to know that you are helping like maybe you've never helped before. For everybody who can be faithful in your giving, I'm asking you to do that online. And give the portion you can give. And then if you can, give the portion that some others who want to give can't right now. And your giving will actually extend some grace and assistance to them. Give as much and as generously and as regularly as you can. Here's a suggestion. In our online giving platforms, you can actually schedule your giving. You can, you can make it recurring so that you don't have to think about it. You don't have to remember. You just know in a consistent way you want to be part of the ministry, spreading the love and message of Jesus, and then helping people in need in very tangible ways. Thank you for being faithful in your giving. Thank you for what you're going to give today. Like I said, thousands already has been distributed to help people, and we know that there are going to be greater needs ahead. So thank you for being a part of that. And thank you so much for being a part of California Community Church today. We have one more song, and if you would, just sing along with it if you know the words, and if not, allow those lyrics to just soak into your spirit to encourage you. God bless you.
soon, friends. <laughs>